The roster of Cathay is unsurprisingly based around harmony between your ranged and melee troops, and building armies around this is essential to getting the most out of them in your battles. They have a selection of powerful ranged units that make them into one of the best turtling factions we have available in the game right now. When you combine this with their powerful casters and tough front lines, you have a seriously strong faction on your hands. Let's first go over the pros and cons of Cathay in battle. As for the pros, when you are maintaining the balance between Yin and Yang, it can boost your army's power by a significant amount. You also have a very powerful selection of ranged units that only get better as the game goes on. You also have very powerful casters with exclusive laws that only you can use that tear up the battlefield in various ways. As for the cons, keeping your units in formations which trigger harmony can leave some in dangerous positions at risk of being caught out. Some of your most valuable flying units can also be taken out by the cheapest enemy flyers, or at least slowed down. And finally, none of your lords, aside from legendaries, are particularly tough or super strong battlers, leading to them taking more of a passive role later into the game. Now it comes to the roster, and one thing to remember before we go into this is that every single unit in the roster is either part of Yin or Yang. Putting units from each side near to each other will buff them depending on their side. Yin units will gain reload skill and leadership, and Yang units will gain melee defense and leadership. This means you need to balance your armies around placing them in formations that allow them to make the most of these buffs, otherwise you're going to believe in a significant amount of value on the table. First up, we have the Lords. Of course, first we have Miao Ying. Now she's a spellcaster, and both legendary Lords amplify the effect of harmony by 100%. She's also armored and a melee expert, and of course, has access to a mix of the laws of life and yin. In her human forms, she is a powerful spellcaster with her mix of laws and can deal some great damage whilst healing units of her own. She can also do some decent damage in melee, with high melee stats and weapon damage, as well as magical attacks, meaning anything she goes up against is going to feel the pain. If you need more melee power, then transforming into a dragon should be right up your street. She gets a big boost to her armor-piercing weapon damage, and can now tear through entire units of infantry with ease, whilst barely taking a scratch with her high armor and HP pool. Of course, she can also fly in this form, so it's extremely fast, and can be anywhere you need her at a moment's notice. Sadly, in this form, she also can't unlock her full book of spells, so you'll have to go back to human form to use all the spell support. I find switching between them throughout the battle is the best way to go to make the most of her powerful fighting and spellcasting when each are needed. She also has a few abilities. Wrath of the Storm improves allies' melee attacks and grants them magical attacks and immune to psychology. Mastery of the Elemental Winds, which improves magical power for every unit within this ability, and Disdain of Dragons, which reduces the melee stats of nearby enemies. Next we have Zhao Ming, similar to his sister, he is a spellcaster, amplifies harmony by 100%, is armoured and melee expert. He of course has no mounts, and has access to a mix of the laws of metal and yang. Zhao is almost exactly the same as Meow, with only a couple of stat differences, with better defence and worse attack and charge bonus. Of course he has two different laws of magic to use, and he has the more offensive, with 4 out of 6 of his spells being focused on dealing damage in various powerful ways. Of course he can also transform into his dragon form for improvements to his melee stats and speed, but this does come at the cost of not being able to make full use of those spells. Similarly to Meow, you want to switch between the two depending on what the situation calls for to make the most of both strengths. And finally, he has the Mastery of the Elemental Winds ability. The Dragon Blooded Shugengun is our first of the non legendary lords. He's a spellcaster and amplifies harmony by 50%. He has access to the Law of Yin or the Law of Yang, and these guys are extremely similar to the legendary siblings aside from the dragon transformations. They are powerful spellcasters no matter which one you pick, so you can deal a ton of damage and send out powerful buffs either way. They are also competent melee fighters with decent stats and damage with those magical attacks, meaning they will do okay against most things you send them against. They aren't really duelists, so if an enemy lord with a ton of AP tries to take them on, it's probably for the best that they make a retreat and get to safety. If they get on their warhorse mount, they gain a lot of speed, armor, and some charge bonus, which works great for keeping them on the move to quickly offer spell support wherever needed, alongside doing some light charging for padding those damage stats. The Jade Longmas enhance their speed even further and grant them flight, allowing them to be anywhere on the map at a moment's notice. They also gain some charge bonus and weapon strength, so will now deal just a little bit more damage when they make contact with enemies. No matter which mount you go for, you still want to use them pretty much the same. Get them in melee and pull them out to provide spell support wherever needed. And finally, they have the Mastery of the Elemental Winds ability. Lord Magistrates have literally no attributes and amplify harmony by 50%. And these are much more basic lords with decent melee stats and weapon strength, but surprisingly low armor, meaning they will fall pretty quickly if they get caught in melee without any support. They also don't have any spells, so you should really keep them back if you're going against anything with damage. What they do have going for them is their inspiring abilities that buff nearby allied units in various ways that can be extremely powerful. They also have some decent mounts. The Warhorse is nothing special with some speed and charge bonus. It does allow them to do some decent melee damage, but compared to the other option, it's hardly fair. 
the Sky Lantern makes them into just that. They have more ammo and melee stats and HP than the standard unit, but other than that, they do the same job, just a little bit stronger, and for a little bit longer. Of course, they still need defending from enemy flyers, but if you can keep them safe, they can deal some serious damage over the course of the battle. Our final lords are the Caradon Masters, and these are very similar to the Lord Magistrates. They amplify harmony by 50%, and only have the one choice of mount of the Warhorse. Again, these are pretty much the Lord Magistrates, but come with Unbreakable, so we'll fight till the bitter end. Use them, pretty much the same, and you can't really go wrong. Coming to the heroes now, first up we have the Alchemists. These amplify harmony by 25% and have access to Lore of Metal. As they are right out of the gates, they are pretty much exclusively spellcasters. With their low armor and not great melee stats, they aren't going to do much in melee, so want to be kept back and toss out their spell support wherever it is needed. Once they unlock their elixirs and enchanted metallurgy abilities, however, they can get right into those front lines with massive buffs to stats that allow them to take on a lot of enemy infantry and even other characters of ease whilst the buffs last. Of course, they could use these buffs on other units, but then they really are simple spellcasters, and where's the fun in that? Like usual, their Warhorse mount gets them some armor, speed, and charge bonus, so it's always worth picking up, but it alone is not enough to get them fighting. Wait for the abilities, and then they'll do just fine. Our other heroes are the Astromancers, and similarly, they amplify harmony by 25% and have access to Law of Heavens. These are very powerful spellcasters with the Law of Heavens at their disposal, meaning they can toss out a massive amount of destructive power as long as they have the winds to fuel them. Similar to alchemists, they are not powerful melee combatants, so want to be kept away from anything but the weakest of enemy units to ensure they survive and make full use of their spells. Of course, the Warhorse mounts bring them the usual buffs that makes them able to zip around the map to provide spell support wherever needed, but the compass mount is so unique and powerful. It essentially makes them into the compass unit itself, with even more weapon strength, so able to provide magical buffs to your army whilst not being too terrible in melee combat either. Just don't let them get surrounded or they will fall very quickly. Coming to melee infantry, first up we have the Peasant Long Spearmen. These are tier 1 units as well as Yang units, have anti-large damage, charge defense versus all, and are expendable. Being immensely cheap, it should come as no surprise that these lads don't exactly have the best fighting stats in the world. They don't have much damage, defense, or armor, so they are going to lose against pretty much anything that isn't Skaven Slaves. Their saving grace is the charge defense versus all, which makes them into great flank defenders, as they will stop a lot of cav dead in their tracks and give your other units time to escape or come around to assist them. If you have no choice but to use them, then be sure to support them with magic and missiles, otherwise they are likely to lose every single time. The Jade Warriors are a tier 1 Yang unit and are armoured and shielded. These lads have shockingly large amounts of armour for this stage in the game. Combined with their shields, their melee defence and their defensive stance, which buffs their armour after standing still for 20 seconds, this makes them into brilliant line holders to keep the enemy still whilst other units do the majority of damage for them. And this is how the damage gets done, since they don't have the best weapon strength for attacking the world, meaning if you leave them alone, they will not pick up many kills. Get some missiles on their flanks or a construct if you can, then you should be just fine. They also come in another variation, Jade Warrior Halberds. These are a tier 2 Yang unit, are armoured and deal armour piercing anti-large damage. These lads lose their shields and a little bit of melee defense in exchange for armor piercing damage and anti-large bonus. This makes them into great mid-game large targets and cavalry assassins. Stick them on the flanks of your front lines and let the enemy come to you and reflect their own charge back at them. If there aren't any large targets, then send them against infantry and they'll do similarly to regular warriors, so we'll need the help all the same. And our final melee infantry unit is the Celestial Dragon Guard. These are a tier 3 Yang unit and come with armor piercing, anti-large damage and charge defense versus all. These are your endgame anti-large frontlines infantry, and to be honest, will probably make up your entire frontlines at this stage of the game. They have exceptional armor and great defense stats, along with charge bonus and reflecting, meaning they want to stand firm and let the enemy come to them to punish any charge they attempt to make. Their damage is also not too shabby, with decently high melee attack stats and a pretty chunky weapon damage. Of course, they are still most effective versus large targets with their halberds, but as I said, they are your best choice for a full front line at this stage of the game, so they'll end up going against everything the game can throw at you. Still support them with missiles, magic and constructs to ensure as swift a defeat to your enemies as possible. We now come to the missile infantry. First up we have peasant archers. These are a tier 1 yin unit, are expendable and have weak damage versus armor. Now if you've played Bretonia in Warhammer 2, then you know that peasant archers can actually be a very promising unit. Now they are very weak and of course want to be gone as soon as you unlock something better, but they are cheap and numerous so you can stack a bunch of them into early game armies for next to nothing and focus fire on key targets on the enemy side to wipe them out as quickly as possible. Aside from this, you want to keep them at the back and safe from enemy melee or cav troops as they will fold like a deck chair if challenged to mortal combat. Once the lines are set, move them to get a good angle on the enemy lines and work with the melee troops to take them out as quickly and safely as possible. Since they have a steep firing arc, they can fire over your troops' heads fairly easily so you don't need as harsh an angle but it certainly can't hurt. 
The Iron Hail Gunners are Tier 1 Yin units and come with armor piercing missiles. These are a very short range missile troop, they have very high damage and a decent amount of ammo with a short firing range and no arc, meaning you need to have a clear line of sights on your enemies to fire. Place them ahead of the melee lines before they clash and have them fire a few volleys before moving back to safety. Once the lines are set, move them around the backs and sides of the front lines to get some clear shots on the enemy flanks. Avoid melee combat at all costs as their stats are just horrible and they won't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. Next we have the Jade Warrior Crossbowmen. These are a tier 2 Yin unit and are armoured. These are a direct step up from the Peasant Archers in pretty much every way. They come with more range, missile strength as well as better survivability in the form of armour. Don't get me wrong though, they should by no means do any melee fighting, but they will stand up a tiny bit better against most forms of damage that isn't overly armor piercing. Their missile strength increase of course makes them do the same job as peasant archers, but only better. Keep them behind your front lines and firing at the enemies on approach. Once the lines clash, get them some good angles either over your allies' heads or on the flanks of the enemy to ensure the highest damage output and least friendly fire. And they also come in another variation, Jade Warrior Crossbowmen with shields. These are a tier 2 yin unit and are armored and shielded. The only difference is, these guys gain a shield and 8 melee defense. Still do not get them in melee if you can help it, but if they do get caught out, they'll survive very slightly longer than without shields. The Crane Gunners are a tier 3 yin unit and are shielded and have armor piercing missiles. Now these are units that will look very familiar to any Skaven players out there. These are basically the caffeine version of Warblock Gisales. They are snipe units with exceptional range and armor piercing missiles that break through shields with ease. Of course, looking like this, they are god-awful melee fighters, but have some good defense from range with their silver shields, so can take a surprising beating as long as it's from range. Place them ahead of your melee lines at the start of battles, and have them focus on high-valued armored targets on their enemy lines to deal as much damage as possible before the lines clash. Once they do, focus on anything in the air or far away, as their shallow firing arc should still allow them to deal meaningful damage. If there are no targets like this, then you'll need to move them to get a good angle or get around on the enemy flanks. Just be careful when doing this as they obviously aren't the fastest guys in the world. And our final ranged infantry unit is the Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen. These are a tier 3 yin unit, are armored and shielded and have armor piercing missiles. These are essentially the shielded jade crossbowmen on steroids with improvements to basically every single stat. They now deal armor piercing damage with the same range and ammo as jades, so want to be used pretty much the same and they'll just do more damage to armored targets. Keep them on the back lines and use the steep firing arc to fire over your unit's heads and take out the enemy from the safety of your back lines. They still want to focus on range damage as their melee damage isn't great, but if they happen to get caught out, they can still do decently with passable melee stats, but not a lot of damage, so get them some support as quickly as possible and then get them back to firing. Coming to the cavalry and chariots, first up we have the peasant horsemen. These are a tier 1 yang unit, are very fast and come with vanguard deployments and are expendable. Quite similar to the other peasant units, these chaps have basically no armor and very poor leadership, so if they get into it with anything even halfway decent, then they are not going to last very long. They should be used exclusively against backlines and retreating units to take out any enemy ranged troops and ensure runners don't come crawling back. Their high speed makes this easy, as there are very few units that can catch them, so getting around the enemy front line becomes a breeze, especially with their vanguard deployments. They technically should be using their charge bonus as much as possible, but at this stage of the game, it should be fine just to send them in to stay, as long as it's versus very weak ranged units. Just keep an eye on them to make sure they don't get too pinned down. The Jade Lancers are a tier 2 Yang unit, and are armored and shielded, and deal anti-infantry damage. These guys are more towards your traditional mid-game shock cavalry. They are now sporting actual armor and leadership at the cost of a little speed, so can stand up to a gentle breeze. They also gain a nice bit of charge bonus and want to make use of it as much as possible to maximize their damage and minimize risk to themselves. Get them around the enemy front lines and charge their backs into the Stone Age until they are headed for the hills and not coming back. After this, you want to cycle charge the front lines to break their spirits as quickly as possible. Just be sure to keep up with their micro as sustained melee combat is for sure not their best use. And finally, we come to the Great Longmer Riders. These are a tier 3 Yang unit, are armored and shielded, and deal anti-infantry damage. Now these lads are basically the Jade Lancers, but better in pretty much every single way. First up, they can fly, so are extremely fast and can get over and around the enemy lines with ease before charging whatever they see and likely breaking them on impact. They are insanely tough with a ton of armor and HP, especially for such a low entity unit. They also come with improved melee stats and weapon damage, but with a charge bonus so juicy, it's a waste to have them sign melee combat. So pull them out to cycle charge for maximum damage and you can't go wrong. Just to be clear though, if you aren't great at micro, you can technically stay in combat, but you are leaving so much value on the table doing this. Coming to the constructs now, we have the one and only Terracotta Sentinel. This is a tier three Yang unit, it is armored, deals armor piercing damage and is unbreakable. These single entity constructs are truly a sight to behold. With their massive size and relatively high speed, they can crash into and through the melee lines to rack up a ton of kills versus even some of the most armored infantry in the game. 
They have exceptionally high weapon damage and melee attack for something so large, so will hit very hard and hit often. They are great versus clumps of infantry, cav or monsters, just make sure whatever they're going against isn't anti-large and they should be just fine. Of course, being so large, they are also easy targets for ranged units, so make sure you take any out, otherwise they're going to go down very quickly. Coming to the Flying War Machines now, first up we have the Sky Lantern. This is a tier 2 yin unit and it amplifies harmony by 25% and these units are always flying. They are essentially hot air balloons with a group of four crane gunners in the basket. They deal great armor piercing damage with a massive range and carry quite a bit of ammo. Since they are flying, they have a great line of sight, so the gunners can pretty much fire non-stop at whatever you want. So simply keep them safe in the sky and focus on whatever armored or priority targets you want to be taking out. Their melee stats are of course terrible, so if the enemy has any flyers, it has to be one of your top priorities to take them out as simple Chaos Furies could bring these guys down if you let them get too close. If they manage to run out of ammo, they are pretty much useless since they can't land, so either retreat them from battle or move them around to provide harmony bonuses to any Yang units nearby. Our other flying war machines are the Sky Junks. These are a tier 3 Yin unit, amplify harmony by 25% and are also always flying. These are somehow very similar to Sky Lanterns but very different at the same time. They deal exceptional damage with their embedded fire cannons and excel at blown up groups of enemy infantry with their explosive shots. They also have a huge range and of course are flying so can shoot at pretty much anything you cast your eye on as long as you have a line of sight. Similar to the Lantern, you must keep them safe from enemy flyers as they cannot defend themselves in melee, but they aren't actually that useless once they run out of ammo since they also have crane gunners in their basket that appear to never ever run out of ammo and will fire until the very end, which is pretty OP. Just make sure you choose your targets wisely for the rockets to get the most value out of them while you can. Now they also come with bombs, so if they happen to be able to get directly over the top of enemy units, they can be dropped some powerful explosive damage on whatever is below. I would say these lads need more management than lanterns, purely to get good angles and avoid blowing up your own units. So get them an angle, and you're all set. And our final category is the artillery and war machines. First up we have the Grand Cannon, and these are tier 2 yin units. These are very powerful artillery pieces with high armor piercing damage for this early in the game, along with a staggeringly large range. If something is on the map, chances are this guy can see it and possibly hit it. They of course belong in your very back lines where they can sit and safely fire as the enemy make their approach, focusing on their highly armoured and most valuable targets. Once the lines do collide, they want to try and get an angle if they can to fire safely into the enemy flanks, but either send them with an escort or be exceptionally careful as they are not fast and have pitiful melee stats. Alternatively, you can focus on any large or more distant targets the enemy has and keep them safely at the back of your lines. If they run out of ammo, then just get them off the field, as they are basically useless. Just don't let them get caught out while they are, or they will quickly fall. The Wuxing War Compass is a tier 2 Yang unit. It amplifies harmony by 25%, and it is a spellcaster. These are essentially the corpse cards of Cathay, but they are actually good. They come with a decent amount of survivability, with high armor and HP alongside melee stats that aren't actually too bad, given what they look like. They also come with a high weapon strength, though not very armor piercing. So if you can get them into a clump of less armored enemies, then they should do not too bad. Now the real reason you'll want to bring them is their spells and abilities. They can use two spells from the Law of Heavens, Celestial Lightning and the unique Celestial Comet. And alongside this, they come with Mastery of the Elemental Winds, which empowers all casters, the more of them with this ability you have on the field, and Nexus of the Elemental Winds, which increases the power recharge rate by 20% at all times. Keep them alive and casting and you'll get more magic and you will certainly not regret it. And our final unit is the Fire Rain Rocket, and this is a Tier 3 Yin unit. Now these lads are basically the sky junks but on land and with less ammo so I'm not entirely sure why you'd go for them unless the enemy's flyers keep screwing you over or you simply haven't got that far up the tech tree yet. They still do the same great anti-infantry explosive damage from an exceptionally long range but are now obviously stuck on the ground. So once lines clash they're going to struggle for angles unless you want to use high damaging shots on less armored range troops. If you have the option between this and the sky junk then every single time I would probably go for the sky junk. But if this is your only option, it'll do the same job, only a little bit worse. Now we'll go through some army compositions. In Warhammer 3, every unit has a tier from 1 to 3. And I'm going to be using these tiers to make you armies for the early, mid and late game, so that you are set for every single step of your campaign. Starting in tier 1, our army is going to be led by the Dragon-Blooded Shugun Lord of Yang. This means you're going to get that very powerful magical value online very early on. And both laws are strong in their own way, but personally, I prefer the destructive power of Yang. But if you want to choose Yin, go right ahead. For the front lines, you're going to go with two peasant long spearmen and five jade warriors. The spearmen will be defending the flanks, since we have no other choice at this stage, and the jade warriors have a good chunk of armor that will last long enough to take out most enemies, even if they don't do a ton of damage themselves. 
For the ranged units, we're going to go with four Iron Hail Gunners, some very early armor piercing missiles that can wipe out most early game units in a couple of volleys and are very, very useful for taking out lords, heroes, and any large targets that are roaming around at this early stage. We're also going to go with four Peasant Archers. They may not be brilliant, but they are dirt cheap and numerous, allowing you to focus down units one at a time with a hail of arrows. And finally, we're going to close us out with four Peasant Horsemen. They are weak, but the speed does allow them to cause some havoc in the back lines, so you can't really complain. Now with this composition, you gain every kind of value right out the gate, with magic value online as soon as you put skills into it, ranged armor piercing power earlier than basically anyone else, a tough front line to hold the enemy back, and a very speedy flanking capacity, albeit a little bit weak and flimsy. Anything an early game army can toss at you, you will have an answer for it. Going to tier 2 now, our Lord of Yang should be on a mount by now, so flying around the map, providing spells where needed, as well as getting into a light amount of combat, if it is safe to do so. Sadly, these boys drop off later into the game as the damage goes up, so keep them safe as much as possible. We're going to pick up an Astromancer for another caster to get value out of the Mastery of the Elemental Winds. Astromancers over Alchemists, purely because the Law of Heavens is just that good, but again, personal preference, if you want an Alchemist, then by all means, go for them. They are still extremely powerful. For the front lines, we're going to be upgrading to two Jade Warrior Halberds and four Jade Warriors. Much tougher anti-large infantry that can eat a mid-game charge and sling out some respectable damage whilst they do. For the range lines, we're going to be dropping to three Iron Hail Gunners. They ain't broke, so I'm not fixing it. We're going to pick up three Jade Crossbows with Shields. Big upgrade in every way over Peasants, so you don't need to focus fire as much and can more leave them to fire at will while you micro the rest of your army. We're going to swap out our Peasant Horsemen for two Jade Lancers. These are a massive upgrade in Cav, as these lads can actually take units out when charging rather than just pinning and slowing them down. They do need a little bit of micro since they aren't that fast, but they are still an extremely powerful flanker. And for our very back lines, we're going to go with two Grand Cannons and two Sky Lanterns. Grand Cannons have brilliant armor piercing damage across a massive range, so you just want to set, forget, and you can't go wrong. The Sky Lanterns bring brilliant armor piercing damage also across a massive range. Just be cautious of enemy flyers and ranged units, as they are so large and mostly defenseless targets. Now, this composition has a very strong caster presence with two explosive laws that can wipe the enemy off the face of the map. It also comes with a much tougher front line that can hold back anything the mid game can throw at you. They also have a high damage output from the back lines and artillery units, and powerful charging capability to counter enemy ranged. Finally, the flying units can get tons of value, you just need to really focus on keeping them safe, as they are just that squishy and easy to take out. Finally, come to tier 3, our Lord of Yang really won't be getting any better from earlier, unless you spec into the yellow tree, which I can't really recommend. Just build them to buff your endgame units, and keep them safe to cast where needed, only send them in if it is against something that you absolutely know they can beat, and they are in no danger of getting taken out, at least until they get immortality. As for the Astromancer, going to get this guy on the compass mount for even more magical power. Other than that, keep him close to the front lines. Don't send him in unless it is something that's fairly weak, otherwise he'll get wiped out with that large hitbox. For the front lines, going to upgrade to six Celestial Dragon Guard. These are, of course, the endgame front line that are basically a brick wall with very pointy sticks. They can wipe enemy large units in an instant just as easy as melee, so they really can do it all. For our ranged units, going to go with two Crane Gunners. Super long range armor piercing damage that can take out units before they even see your lines. They're great at focus firing key targets, just can be tricky finding targets once your lines clash. We're also going to go with two Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen. These are crossbowmen with armor piercing damage, and they are tough, and can actually do stuff in melee. What more could you want? We're going to go with two Great Long Mariders to replace our Jade Lancers. These are powerful flying cav that are the ultimate flankers, as well as being powerful units to keep your flyers safe. For a bit more frontlines presence, we're going to go with two Terracotta Sentinels. These are massive frontlines constructs with huge area of effect attacks, as well as decent large dueling potential. We're going to go with two Sky Junks. If you can keep them alive, then they will blow up blobs of infantry and rack up massive numbers of kills. On top of this, Crane Gunners on board fire forever, so as long as they are alive, they will be getting you kills and value. And closing us out, we have two Grand Cannons. You don't really have a better option for long range armor piercing damage, so no need to replace them. Now, this composition is very reliant on ranged, with almost all of the damage output coming from your ranged troops. This means if the enemy is very fast and can flank you, it might be a good idea to find a corner just to be safe. And you also need to be very wary of flyers and ranged focused armies as they can take out your sky junks at a rapid rate and they are not units you want to be playing without. If you manage to do all this and keep everything safe, the damage output is astronomical and there is no front line in the game that can stand up to the punishment you deal out. And that concludes everything you need to know about the Cathay armies. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. If you did, then be sure to leave a like, it really does help out so very much. Leave any questions you have in the comments down below and I'd be more than happy to answer them. If you want to see more videos like this showing you how to play every other faction in Warhammer 3, then be sure to subscribe so you'll never miss a video. On Friday, we begin the Nurgle Guides. The Plague Fiver may have gotten a little too literal lately, but his faction is a truly unique one and it is extremely powerful. 
And finally, if you'd like to support the channel, you can become a member here on YouTube, a subscriber on Twitch, or a patron on Patreon. Doing so gets you shout outs on the end screen like Dominic Shamas and of course Henry Tucker for his support at that unclean one's tier. One more thank you to every single one of you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Damders, and I will see you next turn.